With a ton of great people getting out to Gwent Challenger 5 this month, we at Team Aratusa thought it was an excellent opportunity to talk with some of those who work to make the event the best it could possibly be. So while the players were getting spruced up for their matches, we sat down with a few fine folks for a chat about them, their roles, and the event itself. Hi everyone and welcome to another one of our Gwent Challenger 5 interviews, this time from CD Projekt Red headquarters itself and this time I am joined by Jagaras. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Oh that's okay, I like it. It's a pleasure. Pleasure is yeah. all mine honestly. Good. I'm glad and we really appreciate it. We, def we wanted to have the chance to talk to all of the casters and get a different perspective on things so yeah there's thank you that's all we can only say it no so it's honestly it's, it's it's i love talking about gwen <laughs> i love talking about casting so for me this is like this is just a, like another day it's great and we're at cd project red which is oh noisy but always cool <laughs> <laughs> okay so let's jump right into some of the questions a year ago as it's been a long it's a year one. at challenger 4 we saw Gwent as it would look after Project Homecoming for the first time. How do you personally feel about how the game's developed in that year since? I was just thinking about this the other day actually because we obviously are looking at the state of the game for Challenger 5 and the thing with Homecoming Gwent was in all honesty like it wasn't very good like it, it had potential but it's kind of understandable why people were critical of it. Mm. Whereas now they've added Syndicate, we've had the Crimson Curse expansion as well. Um, and the state of the game in general is just, I think, really good. And especially this tournament where we're seeing all six factions actually represented uh, across the tournament. Mm. It just shows that the state of the game is, is very healthy. I mean, we have had some you know uncomfortable metas, like the recent full test Dijkstra shenanigans wasn't great, but the very current state of Gwent, I think this is a really good time to get involved yeah. in Gwent. This is yeah. like a great time for people who left to come back and get back involved and see exactly what it is that Gwent's all about at the moment, because honestly, it's great. And it's a good place for a tournament as well. Like the meta is in this perfect storm scenario where the Gwent challenger can be, it could be awesome what we're about to see tomorrow. Oh, the meta for the tournament is very exciting. Like, uh, I kind of was feeling especially hyped for this event going in because of the state of the meta and the kind of decks that we expect to see. Like, yes, there's a lot of, say, Francesca, for example. Like, she's very well represented with every player bringing a Francesca deck. But other than that, I think, like, across the board, there's a lot of diversity. And as a caster, we love to see deck diversity because it means that we're not commentating the same, same matchups yeah. over and over. And, like, we do need to prep more for that because, obviously, we need to, like, know more decks. But ultimately, I think it's a better experience for us as commentators and for viewers to have mm. a you know, an exciting, a spicy tournament, shall we say. So from Gwen Challenger 4, going a little bit further back, your first casting experience was Gwent Open 6, I think? Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you think that you have come along as a caster in that time? Oh, it's like, it's like chalk and cheese. Like, I feel like I'm so much different now compared to how I was as a caster when I started. Like, I don't think my casting debut was bad necessarily, but you could tell how nervous I felt. Like, I definitely spoke very quickly. Um, me and Panda, you know, we had to find our flow in terms of the back and forth between the two of us. And that was something that took a little bit of, you know, finding its footing. Whereas mm. now it's like, the whole thing is very relaxed. I know what to expect in terms of when we talk about, you know, decks, when we talk about brackets, when we're talking about prizing, what goes where, when we talk about the Twitter poll, for example, all these things have just become routine. And as soon as you feel more comfortable, I think that's when your personality can really shine. And that's when the dynamic between casters really kind of comes to the forefront. So it has been, like you said, over a year now. And I do think like, I've improved a lot, but Panda and I as a duo have also, mm. you know, grown together, to, together yeah. I would say. Okay, cool. I think we'll come back to that in a little bit, because that dynamic between casters is something that I think we don't see enough of. So, of course, you are not just a Gwen Masters caster. That's not your only role within the Gwen community. You're the Nilfgaard <laughs> ambassador as well. Praise be to the great son. I'm a, I'm a Nilfgaard <laughs> fan myself. 
Um, what do you think the chances are for Nilfgaard in this tournament? Because they've had a bit of a roller coaster few months in terms of the ladder. Nilfgaard's interesting. I, I want to first off say that I am not a very good Nilfgaard ambassador. I will hold up my hands and admit to that. Like some people think like that I'm just like I'm unaware of this, but I, I haven't done the best job in recent times. However, however, with that said, Nilfgaard in the tournament is interesting. Nilfgaard is kind of in the middle, I would say, mm. in terms of power level. It's not Syndicate Scoia'tael levels of strong, but it's also not Skellige levels of weak. And it kind of comes down to, I think, if players choose to run Arrakis Queen, so monsters, I think they'll leave Nilfgaard behind. But if you don't want to take the risk of running Arrakis Queen because you can target her, then you bring Nilfgaard. And Nilfgaard, you can run, you know, Ardal and you can run Calvay, but they're very similar lists in terms of running like Tourney Joust and uh, Assassinate, like the, the removal cards. And uh, Yennefer Invocation is just insane at the moment, very powerful card. And especially with Calvay, where you can quite easily double play it, you know, they do have some interesting removal tools, but I still feel like they're a little bit lacking in identity. Okay. You know, yeah. if you look at. Um, other factions, let's say Skellige, you've got like your great swords and you've got your your priests and you've got these interactions with like Harold and stuff and they, they definitely have a kind of a feel to them. Syndicate with coins, monsters, you've got like consume and death wish and very clear archetypes and the only real kind of clear archetype with Nilfgaard is tactics, which people are running with both Calve and yeah. with uh, and with Ardal. Whereas Assimilate doesn't really feel very good. You know, it's like when you play you know, no one's playing Anna Henrietta, for example, and it just feels, I always just always feel like they're a little bit lacking and that, uh, from a faction ambassador perspective, is quite disappointing. And I have said that, that you know, I always really feel like Nilfgaard, they just need something to kind of refresh them. And they did get the, the Nilfgaard update, but it, I don't think that was yeah. enough for the faction. And, you know, people say make Nilfgaard great again, but I, I do feel like they're just a few key pieces away mm. from having something, something special, whether it be spies or, you know, I know they have some stuff with soldiers, for example. Like, there are possible archetypes that you could generate with a few new cards. Mm. So hopefully that's something that we'll see yeah. as, as the game progresses. It's interesting that you talk about the archetypes. Obviously, archetypes as a general principle in Gwent disappeared for a little while. But then we saw Syndicate come in with so much synergy and then the Northern Realm update added all of the, uh, the, the the synergy back to the Northern Realm's bronzes. And generally now we're seeing each faction, month after month after month, get these big reworks. Is that something that CD Projekt Red is talking to the faction ambassadors about, that you're working with in the same way as the starter decks? We, we do give them a fair amount of feedback, to be honest, about uh, specific things within the faction um, and you know make suggestions for cards which don't feel like that they're feeling like they're missing stuff and there is definitely a discourse there and when it comes to the starter decks for example there was a lot of people don't realize but there was a lot of kind of behind the scenes discussion yeah. and we went through a lot of iterations and I, I do feel like myself especially about the faction masters across the board we were very kind of vocal in when we didn't think what they were producing was good enough like mm -hmm. you need new players to have a deck or a, a, an experience that introduces them to the game so it's not too complicated but also that they feel like they can win with and sometimes it really felt like you know especially with the original starter decks they were just giving them like terrible bronzes that were neutral like elder bear for example it's like here's a six point body for i think it was six provisions or something and it's just like this is not good enough this doesn't encourage new people to love gwen you yeah. know in the way that we love gwen um, so we do have a lot of kind of back and forth and with the starter decks they're in a better position and I mean when we come to events like this especially at CD Projekt Red it, it's very easy for us to give feedback directly which does help like uh, Slama, Jason Slama who is the uh, lead director on the, the kind of game he um, he always comes to talk to us about different things. He asks our opinions on things, but not just the ambassadors, just like the, the casters, the players. I know a lot of people are coming to see the event, and I'm sure at that point they'll be gathering feedback as well. So they, they do listen, you know, to, to our concerns. Um, but I think that's not just specific to faction ambassadors. I think that they listen to, you know, members of the community yeah. in general. But also they have to make their own decisions, and you know, we have to respect that as fans. Fans, yeah. So there are. 
As there are a lot of aspects to being a caster. You don't just have to have game knowledge, you have to have the presentation, you have to have the direction aspect as well, and perhaps more importantly, most importantly, you have to work well with your casting partner. How do you prepare for that event to event? I think there's there's different aspects to prep. Like me and Panda don't necessarily prep by practicing casting together that much just because we have a good rapport anyway mm. um, and we're good friends. Like before I was a caster, I ended up getting to know him and we would play video games like not just me and him, like with other people too, but like we had a friendship already, which helps. And you can see that if you look at, say, McBeard and Flake, like they were friends beforehand and they, they have good synergy. Um, so some of the prep is just going through decks. So playing Gwent, and that, that's a good way to prep. But also, uh, we prep. Uh, we actually did a lot of work with Team Eratusa this time around. Um, all the casters, uh, whether that was spectating. So we spectated some scrims, and we worked with, say, Malegion, for example, and he was talking us through different lines of play, and we'd watch him play and ask questions and stuff. We did a Arrakis Queen session with Gwent to Town as well. Um, where he was just like talking about different aspects of the deck, sequencing. Um, I mean, he did tell us that you mulligan these cards because they are for provisions and this is Gwent, <laughs> which I'm not quite sure is like what you say on a cast, but we, we, we go through prep in, in that kind of aspect. Um, but also watching other players, I do that a lot. Twitch streams, for example, um, because it's a good way to see different deck strategies. It's a good way to see different lines of thinking to how I would play a deck. Uh, and it's also just good to ask questions because the streamers often will just like, if, if there's something I'm not sure about, I'll just ask in the chat. I'll be like, you know, why do you favor this card over that card? Say something like Manticore Venom over, uh, I always want to call it Dothraki Heatwave, but it's Karathi Heatwave uh, <laughs> over in, in say, Arrakis Queen. Like, yeah. why, why would you make that choice personally? And that then can feed into your commentary during a cast because you have, you then gain talking points. So prepping, we do a lot of, like I said, a lot of different things. Um, in terms of in terms of the synergy, that was definitely something like we did when I first became a caster. We did a uh, audition, so it wasn't like they just were like, "You can be a caster." Like they auditioned me and some other people, and they they tested our synergy. So they were already kind of happy with yeah. where it was at. And then the more events you do, also just the more practice you have casting together uh, in an official capacity, the better you're going to be as a duo because you kind of get a read on when one person's going to stop talking or one person's going to start and make sure that you share the commentary and don't, you know, one person yeah. hog the, the, the whole kind of commentary or one person not say anything. Was that the most... I know you said you got to know each other beforehand and you were already friendly and that must have meant that that must have made the casting experience, as you said, the synergy better to begin with. But did you find that it was still a bit of a stumbling block to go straight into your first tournament and have to sit down and actually do it for the first time? I think, yeah, with synergy, it, it, it does kind of improve over time because yeah. you relax more. And I was really overthinking it on the first tournament. I was very self-aware. I was very aware of, I've got to do a good job. You know, I want to continue to be able to do this. I've got to impress CD Projekt Red. I've got to make a good first impression for the community. I've got to not say the wrong thing because everyone will jump down my throat. And I was really felt under pressure. And I think like with, with the synergy that then meant that there wasn't as much humor in the cast. There wasn't that, you know, kind of camaraderie or the uh, people like to use the word like banter. And then as time has gone on, um, Panda's always been great. Like he's, he's very good at what he does. Uh, but I was then able to relax and then we have more kind of, we can have more of a laugh. We'll have sometimes running jokes yeah. through the cast, whether I'm asking him if he wants to hear a limerick, just because that is what uh, Geralt says about, about um, oh, this is Lambert. Lambert. What, a, what a prick, you know? Uh, <laughs> So we have these kind of things that then can become more of a kind of give it a bit more fun and they give it a bit more flavor and that was definitely missing you know in the very first event it's like went open number six just because I was I was so nervous. Yeah I mean it's it's good that you bring up that specific point about the limerick because that feeds into the next question quite well, uh, nicely. You are also the Gwent ambassador for tournament puns. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, you, uh, I noticed with Gwent Open 7, you did spend a lot of time trying to push Panda into that limerick joke. I, and, it, and it made me genuinely curious, like, when you are 
uh, do you pr do you prepare some of these in advance when you see some of the things the players are doing, or are they all just spare of the moment off the cuff? Puns are, that's an interesting topic because when I first did Gwent Open Six, that was one of the things Vlad, who's like the esports manager, said. He was just like. Like one of the things that you really bring to the table is the puns, and like you know, keep doing that. Mm. But it is something that's quite polarizing. Some people absolutely hate them, and I also get so I get messages being like, she just needs to stop making a pun every second like sentence. And then other people are like, we need more puns. I'm just like, these are polar opposites. But in terms of coming up with them, a lot of it is on the spot, depending on on the situation. Like I remember one time they were playing a card called Sentry, and I was like, "Oh, that's the play of the Sentry," or something. And that was just like sometimes it just clicks, and you're just like, "We're going with it." But some of them also, you just spend time looking at decks and looking at cards enough that there'll be certain puns that you kind of think of beforehand. Like you can easily say, for example, that we're going to see ban Cheska because we've got eight yeah. Francesca players and I reckon a lot of the time she's going to be banned. As a Francesca myself, that then also easily leads it to, well, well at least we'll see one Francesca. You know, yeah. th this, these sort of things can kind of just, you have a little bit of thought about how you can twist the name or yeah, twist the words. Sure. Um, so some of it is, yeah, we talk about it, you know, we can say like a player's shooper if it's like, if it's a shoot deck and it's a really great play, for example. Um, if you look at player names, you can do stuff with that. If, if Tailbot loses, he becomes Failbot. You could be like, if Demorcus has a great name, damn, Morcus, you know. Uh, th there's different things you can do with, with words, but it's just, some of it is just being kind of, sure. oh, you know, it just clicks and you just go with it. And it's not something that's like, you can teach someone to be like this many puns. It's just I I can't help myself. I'm secretly a dad. Well, I'm not obviously. I'm not okay. a dad. But like the number of dad dad level yeah. jokes that I make, I might as well sure. have like a freaking <laughs> horde of gene. children. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So for the final question, the big one, who do you think will win this challenger? Who do you think wins challenge five? Oh, that's a tough question. Who do I think will win? <laughs> Probably, I, I want to say Colomon, but I also, I don't know, it depends if he can beat Tailbot. I think that's going to be a really interesting set, but yeah, I'm going to say Colomon. I, I also think Colomon deserves to win. He's like, Tailbot's won it before. He doesn't need another win. Demorcus has won it before. He's fine. Freddy's won it before. Everyone else is kind of new, so they tend to do worse. So I'm going to say, okay. I'm going to go Colomon. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much for your time again. Thank you for watching, everyone, and thank you, CD Projekt Red, not just for allowing us to do this, but to do it here in their awesome lobby. It's been amazing. See you for another interview very soon.